Suzuki Ichiro was a 29-year-old young man who worked as a game programmer. On Sunday, he was waiting for the train at the station. It turned out that the train arrived earlier than he expected so he had to rush to get on. Suzuki just realized that it was Sunday, so the train usually arrived earlier. As a game programmer, working overtime on weekends had become a daily occurrence. Because of that, he was single and had no other life apart from working all the time. Not long after, Suzuki arrived at the office. He sat at his desk, opened the work file, and immediately started working. Not long after, his teammates came while he was working. The game being worked on was War World, which was considered too difficult by their clients. Beginners definitely won't be able to enjoy playing this game. Suzuki was asked to make the game level easier. But Suzuki refused because if it were made any easier, the target market for the game would definitely not want to play. Suzuki offered a reward mechanism for players who could complete missions without equipment or anything like that. That way, pro players would still enjoy playing it. Meanwhile, newbies definitely won't have too much trouble. The idea was approved by his teammates, but Suzuki asked him to contact the client and ask first about the idea. Suzuki didn't want to suddenly change the mechanism again in the middle of the road. After that, Suzuki decided to rest and have lunch first. He wandered outside and met a lost child. He approached the missing child who was crying. Luckily, the mother of the missing child came and thanked Suzuki. When they left, Suzuki thought that the child's mother was beautiful too. After lunch, Suzuki returned to the office. He worked hard until the night to take care of the game he was working on. When he was finished, he tested his coding results and played the game. The title was Freedom Fantasy Life. While he was testing the game, his colleagues said goodbye and go home. It turned out that he hadn't come home from work for three days. His wife would grumble if he didn't come home. Suzuki was jealous because someone was so caring to his colleague. That was why Suzuki was asked to immediately find a girlfriend. But with a work cycle like that, Suzuki didn't have time to look for a girlfriend. After testing the game, Suzuki moved on to other work. Until morning, he had not rested. The next day, he still had to continue working again. He kept working until he forgot to shower because he was so busy. One afternoon, he had finished doing his homework, but his teammates said there was a bug in the inventory section. Suzuki was surprised because he had just fixed a bug in the inventory. But it turned out that what he was working on was the game Freedom Fantasy Life. Meanwhile, what his colleague meant was War World. Suzuki was forced to resolve the bug. It was already evening when he finished his work. All his colleagues had gone home. But some lie down in the office. Suzuki decided to rest for a while. He lied down on the floor and stole time to sleep. This young man was truly a corporate slave. When Suzuki woke up, he was no longer in the office, but in a barren land. He stood up and looked around. When he checked his cell phone, it turned out that it couldn't be used. What was even more surprising was that from Suzuki's cell phone screen, he saw his face, which looked back to when he was in high school. Suzuki thought he was dreaming. He often dreamt of entering the gaming world while working on various bugs. According to him, it was also annoying if he had a dream of entering the super dangerous world of war. When he looked around, the world around him was also similar to the game Freedom Fantasy Life. Suzuki believed that this world was a combination of a war world and a freedom fantasy life in one. Suzuki saw the interface display through his eyes. He tried pressing some buttons, but they wouldn't work. Just when he thought about accessing the button, the menu he wanted appeared. Suzuki realized that he only needed to use his mind to access everything. When he looked at the profile, the name Suzuki used was Situ Pendragon, the same as the name he used when testing the game. When he checked the map, it turned out he was in Dragon Valley. Unfortunately, there was a large troop that was speeding through Dragon Valley. Suzuki immediately hid because there was no way he, who was only level 1, could fight them. The lizardmen troops arrived at the place where Suzuki was hiding. One of the lizardmen threw an arrow and it scratched Suzuki's skin. Unfortunately, Suzuki could feel his skin burning when hit by the arrow. Not long after, the lizardmen soldiers launched hundreds of arrows at Suzuki. He immediately hid behind the rocks while trying to launch a meteor shower. But nothing happened even though he pressed it many times. Just when he felt he was going to die, suddenly dozens of meteors appeared from the sky and then destroyed the entire lizardman troops. The powerful explosion thundered repeatedly. Meanwhile, Suzuki hid behind rocks while launching attack after attack. Suzuki's experience points for EXP had increased drastically. Suzuki, or now his name was Satu in that world, managed to survive the lizardman attack. Then he turned to slaughtering one of the remaining soldiers. Sometime later, when the meteor shower stopped, Satu tried to get up. Unfortunately, there was one lizardman soldier who was not hit. Since the distance was quite close to Setu's location, the soldier threw a sword and asked Setu to fight using that sword against him. Unwilling to die, Setu took a sword and fought the soldier. During the fight, Setu saw his enemy's healing points or HP starting to run out. Then he threw the sword and succeeded in killing his opponent. Setu rested after defeating the lizardman. He tried lobbing out but still couldn't. He wanted to save the progress but couldn't. 
When he checked his profile, it turned out that his level and skills had gone up very drastically. It turned out that fighting against the Lizardman troops and using Meteor Shower made his level of progress rise quickly. Amazingly, the wound that Satu suffered earlier also healed instantly. All existing skills were at the maximum level. Then Satu tried the Meteor Shower skill again to test how powerful his progress was. He was shocked when the Meteor Shower caused such severe destruction in the surrounding area that Satu had to flee the place. When it was successful and Satu was safe, he thought that if magic like that continued to be used, he might be mistaken for a demon king in the future. Satu also checked the inventory. After defeating the Lizardman troops, he obtained a lot of colonial goods. He took out the water and drank as much as he could because the water couldn't run out. When he checked his inventory again, there was already a lot of money. With that kind of money, he wouldn't have any trouble when he had to go to town to buy something. Then Satu changed clothes, made a campfire, and relaxed there. While relaxing, he tried to understand the mechanics of the game. To get new skills, he didn't have to level up but just perform some actions. After learning a lot of things, Satu went straight to sleep. The next day, he wandered towards the knight's fortress, which was the closest location. Even though it was the closest, it took Satu a day and a night to arrive. He arrived at the knight fortress the next day. When he got there, Satu could see a wider location. He was in the vicinity of the kingdom and very close to Seru City. There were 100 soldiers nearby whose level was level 31, while the rest were at level 7. Just as Satu was checking the surroundings, suddenly a wavern, a dragon-like creature, appeared and attacked Satu. He fell after being hit by the wavern, but strangely he didn't feel any pain. Because the wavern wanted to attack again, Satu threw rocks at it. The wavern was immediately frightened and flew away. Satu only realized how strong he was after reaching level 310. Unfortunately, the wavern flew towards the troops that Satu had seen. Satu didn't want anyone to get hurt. Satu rushed to chase the wavern. Unfortunately, he was too late because Wavern was already terrorizing the soldiers. A war broke out. Unfortunately, the soldiers were not strong enough to defeat the Wavern. One of the soldiers, a girl named Xena Marion Teal, jumped to beat Wavern. But instead, she was attacked back and fell. Savage jumped and caught the girl to save her. Then they got to a safe place and got acquainted. It turned out that Xena was one of the witches on duty in Seru City. Not long after, two of Xena's female friends, Lilio and Iona, appeared. They were suspicious of Setu, but Xena explained that Setu had saved her. Iona asked about Setu's identity. Because he was confused, Setu said that he was a traitor who ran away and lost his merchandise due to the meteor shower. Luckily, the story made enough sense for Iona. They then rode a horse-drawn carriage and were taken to the city. On the way, Setu saw the soldiers who had defeated the wavern and skinned his body. Arriving in town, Iona took Setu to the registration area. When the information regarding Setu's identity was checked, it was recorded that in the documents he was considered level 1. After paying for the residence visa service, Seku separated from Iona Zina and Lilio. Iona had suggested Satu stay at the Gate Inn which was close to the gate. Satu then decided to go there. But on the way, he was invited by a cute girl named Martha to stay at her place, namely the Monzen Inn, owned by Mosa, her mother. He arrived at the inn and met Mosa. Having already entered, Satu ordered a room and food. Martha was asked to clean up the room for Satu. After Martha left, her mother told Setu that yesterday there was a meteor shower that hit the Dragon Valley area. According to people, it was the work of the Demon King. Setu was surprised that there was a Demon King also in that world. But according to Mosa, the Demon King was defeated by a hero decades ago. After telling about the Demon King and the Wavern, Mosa left. Setu then ate the food he had ordered. Not long afterward, Martha arrived. Stato asked where he could buy daily supplies. Martha pointed out the location. She was excited to show Satu around town. They then toured the city. After that, on the road around the market, two demi-human children hit a man. Because he was annoyed, the man started to scold them. Satu came and stopped the man's nagging. After that, Sekidu helped clean up the firewood belonging to the two demi-human children. They thanked them and went away to their mother. Martha was surprised to see Satu acting well with demi-human. Demi-humans were hated because many farmers had been killed by them in the past. After that, they went around the market. Satu bargained with a merchant and managed to get a cheap price. He also bought hair jewelry for Martha. Martha felt very happy because he had bought something for her. They continued to wander around. Martha showed the dragon mask usually worn at the harvest festival. Then the merchant showed a wig that was usually worn during festivals to make them become a princess. Because he believed the merchant's story, Satu instead bought those two unimportant things. After exploring further, Satu decided that the world was also very different from war world or freedom fantasy life. Satu looked at the menu display and tried to find something. Unfortunately, he didn't get anything useful. Because he was restless, 
He instead went wandering around the city at night. If Satu could finish that game, he might be able to come back. But he just remembered that this MMO game never ended. That was why Setu's main focus was to explore that world further. The next day, Setu was woken up by Martha. According to Martha, Setu's girlfriend was already waiting downstairs. Setu was confused about who Martha was referring to. When he came down, it turned out that Zena was waiting for him. Zena was free from work so she could wander around as she pleased. Zena took Setu for a walk that morning. After that, they walked around the city. Zena bought two rissoles, but instead, Setu paid. Zena said that she wanted to pay Satu in return because Satu had saved her yesterday. But Satu didn't mind it. Then they sat together in the garden while eating rissoles. After that, they continued to buy other food and tried many types of food. Satu was really interested in the fried dragon wings which turned out to be just bat wings coated in soy sauce. Just as he was about to eat, a small child nudged Zena, causing the soy sauce and the bat's wings to stain her clothes. That was when a witch appeared. She offered laundry services using magic. They went into the alley, and the washing process began. In a short time, Zena's clothes were clean as before. Then they continued their journey. Sato asked Zena how to recite magic. Zena explained various theories about magic which made Satu confused. It turned out that Zena had been taught to use magic since she was a child. Even though her education was difficult, she was happy because magic really helped her. She even wanted to try flying using magic. Sato said that if they could date while flying it would be fun too. Zena immediately became embarrassed and asked Satu to wait until she could fly. After being satisfied with walking around the market, Satu was invited to the fort outside town. From there, Satu could see there was a windmill in the middle of the city. Zena said the windmill was used for milling and could also be used as a shelter for residents if a wavern attacked. Satu was invited there. During their journey, they passed a temple and Zena invited Satu to stop by it. Inside the temple, there was a painting of a hero fighting the demon king. The hero wielded a holy sword that gleamed blue. It was said that only heroes could emit that blue color from the holy sword. If it were a person who wasn't a hero, then the holy sword wouldn't be able to glow blue. However, as long as the holy sword recognized its use, it would also glow blue. At that time, the temple keeper, a girl named Orna, said that using a holy sword alone was not enough to defeat the demon king. She said that only the hero who received the call of the young goddess, Miss Perian, could defeat the demon king. Xena then introduced Orna to Setu. Orna was a temple priestess who served the goddess Parian. Orna was a child from a noble family who was taken care of by Zena's mother. While they were chatting, Orna was suddenly called because she had to heal someone. They separated. After that, Satu and Zena met a man who owned a horse-drawn carriage. While Zena was bargaining, Satu checked some of the titles he got. He was shocked because he received so many nicknames, ranging from God Killer and other terrible nicknames. He realized that his meteor shower technique could be used to kill gods, because he was too overpowered. He decided not to do anything flashy there. He and Zena went in a horse-drawn carriage. Afterward, while traveling, Zena told him about the anti-dragon cannons on the wall towers. The cannon would automatically fire if a dragon attacked. One of the towers appeared to be destroyed because a small dragon had managed to crash into it in the past. There was also a large dragon that could break through walls. Setu asked if it was time for the hero to come. But Zena said heroes would only be summoned if a demon king attacked. Through a special ritual, a hero would emerge and fight the demon king. Each generation was usually attacked by a different demon king. Some could control wild animals, some could control the demon race. Not long after, they arrived at the city center. There was a crowd of residents there who listened to Pastor Zakun's ramblings. The priest said that these demi-humans were demons, therefore killing demi-humans would definitely be rewarding. In the middle of the crowd were three chained demi-humans. Pastor Zakun started throwing stones at them. Zena jumped off the horse carriage and protected the demi-humans. She was scolded by priest Zekuin for protecting the demons. Meanwhile, Satu was stunned because he was amazed by Zena's actions. Not wanting to remain silent, Satu scanned the people there. He was able to find several people who were provocateurs and then arrested them one by one. Meanwhile, the priest from the Parian temple appeared and supported Zena's actions. Priest Zekuin could be arrested for refusing the kingdom's rules about torturing demi-humans. Meanwhile, Sekyu had succeeded in paralyzing all the provocateurs and capturing their boss. He brought the boss to the public and said that he was the real source of the problem. The young man was named Urz and he had lent his slaves, the demi-humans, to priest Zekyuan to sell stones that were sent to be holy and incited many people. That was when Urz got up and a demon appeared through his chest. Everyone ran away, running away. Sekyu came to the demi-humans and asked them to run. However, their master, Urz, had asked them to stay there. If they argued then the chain around their neck would shrink. But when Satu checked the status of the slaves, they no longer had masters. 
Maybe because Urz was dead. Xena and some soldiers came to defeat the rampaging demon. Sadu tried to stop them but was too late. A magic circle was created, and they all moved to the demon's lair. Satu was with the three demi-humans. They must be able to get out of the underground demon labyrinth. Satu then got acquainted with the three demi-humans. Turned out they didn't have a proper name. That was why Satu gave them the names Pochi, Tama, and Liza. Afterwards, Satu gave them clean clothes, ointment to treat wounds, and delicious food. They were all grateful because Satu was so nice to them. After that, Satu checked the demon labyrinth map. After walking for a while, Satu was told there was a suspicious smell ahead. They crept forward and looked into a room. There was a monster there that was eating humans. Satu was confused about what to do. But Lisa said they should sneak away while the monster ate the humans. Even so, Satu was determined to take another step. He shot the monster with a magic weapon until it died. He asked Lisa and the others to keep the magic weapon a secret. After that, Satu made a spear from the monster. Meanwhile, Lisa took the pearl ball, which was the core of the monster. Liza said monster cores could be exchanged for items in the shop. After that, Satu destroyed the chains binding the slaves. Then he gave them guns. Satu asked Liza to teach Pochi and Tama to take the cores and the bodies of the next monsters. They continued their journey through the demon labyrinth. During their journey, they faced monster after monster. The levels of these three demi-humans began to increase little by little. After getting tired of walking, they rested and ate the lunch that Satu brought. After eating, they went to sleep. Once ready, they continued their journey again. Sadu asked Pochi and Tama to take turns throwing rocks at the monster to make the monster turn around. Then Satu beat the monster to death. All obstacles were overcome and no one was injured at all. Not only monsters, but they also found a room containing a unique potion there. After that, they fought caterpillar monsters, rat monsters, and also lizard monsters. Even these demi-humans managed to defeat the toad monster without any help from Satu at all. Then Lisa asked permission to cook toad monster meat. Satu allowed it, and they ate the frog meat satay with just salt. Their levels all started to rise little by little. The journey continued. Not long after, Satu met a slime monster who attacked him with fire. But because the slime was already level 10, his fire magic didn't work. Liza said that if they attacked a slime, they had to directly target its core. Liza stepped forward and finished off the slime monster alone. It wasn't long before danger emerged. There was a vicious monster with level 40 approaching and ready to attack. The monster tried to pounce on Satu. While holding back the monsters, Satu scanned the surrounding walls. He realized there was a trap room behind it. Satu then threw the monster against the wall until it broke. The monster fell into the trap. After overcoming the level 40 monster, it continued their journey until they came to a room full of spiderwebs. There were several rolls of nets containing people. Satu asked Liza, Tama, and Pochi to help him free the trapped humans. The two people who were saved were rich. They would reward them if they successfully exit the maze. Meanwhile, Pokey got scolded by the man who wanted her to help. The man didn't want to be helped by demi-humans. Satu called Pochi towards him. When he saw Satu, the ungrateful man asked for help. But Satu had lost his intention to help him. Especially when he saw the man's behavior. Satu told him to free himself. The man screamed until it hurt his ears. The ungrateful man pretended to want to fight the slime, but instead he got scared when the slime monster he was fighting couldn't die. Luckily, Pochi and Liza appeared and beat the slime monster. Satu slaughtered the slime monsters and then saved Xena, who was being held by one of the slime monsters. Xena met the three demi-humans. The three of them were grateful for the help they had received while in town. After that, the group tried to find a way out of the demon labyrinth. After that, Tama felt something strange with one of the walls. When Satu checked using the map, he saw that there was a secret door there. The door was connected to the passage where he threw the level 40 monster earlier. Unfortunately, the demon turned out to be strong enough to withstand the onslaught of the soldiers. Setu couldn't help but fight. But at that moment, a level 40 monster from the secret door dragged Setu and fell free. Setu managed to jump into a room. Then he took out the holy sword to slaughter the monster until it died. Setu used the dragon mask and wig he just bought yesterday with Martha. With an appearance like that, he could fight without being noticed. Then he went back up and beat the demon. Before dying, the demon created a ritual to summon a high race demon. Magic appeared, and a terrible demon came. The demon ate the lower demon that summoned it. After that, the demon carried out a massacre, but Satu managed to save the people there. After that, he took out the holy sword and was ready to fight the giant demon. Unfortunately, the holy sword could not be used to its full potential. Satu also used a gun, but the attack wasn't strong enough to hurt the demon. Then Satu switched to using another magic weapon. He threw a fireball that hit the giant demon with great force. Even so, the giant demon could still survive. 
Seeing that attack, Jin Belton was very amazed and was sure it was high-level magic Crimson Jevelin. Even though Satu only used low-level magic, namely Fire Shot, Satu advanced while carrying out continuous fire attacks to defeat such a powerful demon. He had to use a Holy Sword, but that Holy Sword could only be effectively used by the owner of the hero title. Meanwhile, Satu didn't have that title yet. However, he had other titles that could be used. Satu took the sword and then went into God Slayer mode. After that, he beat the giant demon to death. The demon king was defeated by a sword other than the Holy Sword. The scene then changed to Satu, who wanted to buy slaves from a slave trader, Nidoran. There were two sisters there, namely Lulu Watari and her sister Arisa. Because Arisa could speak Japanese and know Setu's name, he suspected the girl was a spy. Setu then whispered something to Lulu. But the girl didn't respond to Setu. Then Setu whispered something to Arisa. The girl immediately became hysterical because she was told there were spiders in her hair. That means Arisa could understand Japanese. Setu ended up buying the two slaves. Satu introduced them to the three demi-humans. Luckily, both Arisa and Lulu didn't hate demi-humans. Arisa got along really well with Pochi and Tama. After that, they wandered around the city. Satu wanted to ask Arisa about the Japanese, but he didn't have much time because there were so many people there. Satu said that if anyone came and did anything, they had to fight. Satu asked her to not kill them, or they might scream and Satu would come soon. After that, Satu returned to his room with Arisa and Lulu. When Satu wanted to take off his clothes, Lulu wanted to help, but Satu said she did need to. Satu asked the girls to change clothes and he won't peep. When Satu had changed his clothes, he was shocked to see the girls who weren't wearing anything. It turned out that Lulu and Arisa wanted to provide evening services for Satu. Satu was shocked. Satu realized that slaves in that world always provided night service for their masters. He said he didn't need night service, but Lulu cried. Setu covered them and asked them both to sleep. He said they didn't need to provide evening service anymore. Setu fell asleep. The next day, Setu woke up and was surprised because Arisa was already sitting on him. Setu felt tempted by Arisa, but he tried to control himself. Then he hugged the girl. He whispered and forbade Arisa to use magic and skills on him. Since it was an order, Arisa couldn't refuse it. Setu realized that Arisa had already used physic magic twice. When talking to the customers before, Arisa also used that kind of magic. Then Arisa used three magic at once on Satu, which were the attraction effect, the seductive atmosphere effect, and the erotic atmosphere effect. Satu asked what Arisa's goal was. Satu also asked her not to lie. Finally, Arisa admitted that she only wanted to please her master. She fell in love with Satu at first sight. When Satu didn't need evening service, Arisa became sad. That was why Arisa secretly climbed into Satu's bed and even wanted to have with him. That was the reason why Arisa activated her magic. Arisa then admitted that her real name was Tachibana Arisa. Just like Satu, she was also Japanese. After she died, Arisa was reincarnated into that world with full memories of her past life. Arisa then asked if Satu also incarnated there. However, she looked at Satu's unchanged appearance. Arisa was sure that Satu was not a reincarnation, but he was just summoned as a hero to that world. Satu was stunned to hear the information. Arisa continued her story that Satu was the second Japanese person she met in that world. Satu thought Lulu was the person Arisa meant, but Arisa said it wasn't Lulu but Lulu's grandfather. Satu asked to be explained about reincarnation and summoning. Arisa said that reincarnation was a person who was previously alive and moved to another world after he died and was born again. Meanwhile, the person who was called would come after a magic ritual had been carried out. Usually, the person summoned by magic was a hero. Setu asked that reincarnation means having to start from a baby. Arisa confirmed it and that was what happened in that world. Setu asked the summoned person whether his appearance was always the same and used the same items from his home world or not. From what Arisa heard, the summoned person would bring the last item he wore and of course his appearance remained the same. After remembering the incident that happened and changing his teenage form, Setu felt that he was not reincarnated or came with summoning magic. Arisa asked if Setu met a god, but Setu answered no. Arisa asked if there was a magic circle when Setu came, but Setu didn't see that either. Arisa then asked again whether Setu came straight away with lots of mana points as well as maximum skills and level. Setu says he really started from level 1, mana points 0, and no skills. But when he remembered carefully, Setu already had the meteor shower skill when he got there. But because Setu was dizzy from all that, he decided to sleep. The next day, Zina came to Setu's room. She was surprised to see Setu sleeping with cute girls. Then she ran away from the inn. Satu just stared when Zena ran away. Arisa said that if it wasn't explained immediately, it would be troublesome. Satu said it was okay because he and Zena were just friends. But when he thought about it carefully, Satu immediately grabbed his clothes and jumped from the window to chase Zena. 
When they met, they immediately danced. Then Satu explained the actual incident. Xena still didn't believe it because Lulu said the guy bought the slave because he wanted her night service. Satu said he was not like that. He bought slaves so they could help with daily matters. Xena began to believe Satu's words so that the situation would be better. Satu even teased the girl. He said Xena was very beautiful. After that, Satu took Xena to a clothing store because he wanted to buy her a beautiful scarf. After buying the scarves, Satu and Xena returned to the inn. Arisa accompanied them while acting innocent. Satu immediately hit Arisa gently because she felt completely innocent. He asked Arisa to go call the others. When the girl left, Satu remembered his chat with Arisa last night. Before going down, Arisa said she was born as a royal princess with her knowledge from her previous life. She helped the Kubuku kingdom gain great prosperity. But who knew what happened? The strategy failed and made the Kubuku kingdom slump. Another kingdom came and colonized the king of Kubuku, and the prince of Kubuku was executed. Meanwhile, the princess was detained. One day, the demon king appeared and burned the kingdom that had invaded it. Arisa and Lulu managed to escape from death. They were almost dying until they met a slave trader. Liza, Tama, Poki, and Arisa met Satu. They said they didn't go because they weren't feeling well. Then Satu gave them money and asked the slaves to buy daily supplies. Arisa asked whether she could use guard magic and concealment magic just in case. After thinking about it, Satu allowed her. Arisa and her group left cheerfully. Xena said the slaves had become more relaxed and cheerful. Satu said that he didn't treat them like slaves so their personalities would become better. After that, Satu invited Xena to search their rented house to find a real estate agent, a girl named Nady. There were three properties available at the time and they visited them one by one. The first property was a very nice house. But its inhabitants were massacred by an alliance of criminals. Because it was scary, Satu and Xena skipped the house. The second property was also very decent, but in front of it was a brothel. They objected. The last one was another nice house. The house was no less beautiful, but in the basement, there was a criminal alliance headquarters. Of course, Satu and Xena refused. There was no suitable home for Satu and Xena. Finally, Natty said she would look for a better house for them that afternoon. After that, Satu and Xena wanted to watch a show. It turned out that Arisa and the others came back. In the end, they were forced to watch it together. When the show was over, Satu asked Liza to buy me for all of them. Liza was very excited and shopping with Pochi and Tama. While walking, Satu and Xena suddenly met Ino, Ru, and several other soldiers. They had been fighting the ant monster, Fang Ant. There were ant monsters that had escaped into the city. At that moment, Pochi and Tama appeared while carrying the ant monsters they had slaughtered. When he saw the monster, Setu felt that there would be an attack of flying monsters soon. He immediately asked Liza and the others to take their weapons and get ready in their respective positions. As expected, thousands of flying ant monsters appeared. Luckily, many of the ant monsters were blocked by the magic walls in the city. But there were quite a few who could get into it. A fight broke out inside. Pochi and Tama together beat the ants who wanted to attack the inn. Unfortunately, some ants got into where Nadi was working. Sadu immediately went there and beat the ant. Unfortunately, there was a poisonous liquid on the stairs, so Nadi was trapped. Fortunately, the manager, an elf named Yusuratoya Bolnin, came and lifted Nadi with his moves. Nadi then introduced Yusuratoya to Satu. After the acquaintance, Satu came back out and saw all the ants that had been defeated. That night, Satu wandered around the city. In one of the alleys, he saw a monster attacking. Then he fought against the monster and managed to defeat it. Setu approached the alley and he met two injured people. He rushed to take the two people to where Nadi and Yusuratoya lived. When he entered, Setu met Nadi and Yusuratoya. He said that Yusuratoya must have known one of the injured people. Yusuratoya checked it. It turned out that one of them was an elf named Mia. Mia's condition was not too serious, but the rat man who protected her had quite serious injuries. Nadi hurriedly went to find a healer. Meanwhile, Setu hurried to follow Nadi because wandering around at night was very dangerous. The next day, Setu went to Nadi's residence. He was told that Mia was not seriously injured, just in pain from losing a lot of mana points. Meanwhile, the rat man's condition was no longer critical. Setu met Mia, and they were now close friends. They also chatted until noon. After that, Setu went back and found the children. He told them that he met an elf princess who was being guarded by an ant soldier. They really wanted to meet the person Setu met. After that, they went there. When they met Mia, they were immediately happy, and she wanted to be friends with her. They also immediately became friends. When Satu wanted to leave, Mia was very clingy to him and didn't want Satu to go anywhere. The next day, Satu bought a horse-drawn carriage to carry goods so he wouldn't be too suspicious. Lulu, who could drive a horse-drawn carriage, taught him to drive it. Throughout the journey at first, Lulu was very quiet, but when Satu asked about Arisa, Lulu immediately went into a long chat. 
While on the road, Setu felt strange because an owl was watching him. They returned to Nadi's place. He saw that Mia was already able to play with the children. That was when Setu saw an owl that was continuing to observe him. Sadhu entered the room of the conscious rat man. The rat man's name was Mize. In that room, there was also Yusura Toya. From Mize, Setu finally knew the chronology of Mia's attack. It turned out that Mia was the princess of a village who was kidnapped by a witch named Zen. Mia's full name was Miserania Bolnin. Her and Navy's names were similar because they both came from Bolnin Forest, home of the World Tree and High Elves. For some reason, she ran away and met Mize. After that, Mize took Mia to meet Yusara Toya. Unfortunately, Zen also chased her there. It turned out that the ant monsters that attacked the city were also sent by Zen. Sadhu felt that Yusur Toya knew the reason why Mia was kidnapped, but he didn't want to tell him. It wasn't long before the children were screaming downstairs. Sadhu and Yusur Toya rushed downstairs, but it turned out the children only screamed because there was lightning. But that was when Satu saw an owl in the room. In an instant, the owl changed shape into another figure. Mize tried to fight the figure that appeared. But the figure used physic magic and made everyone collapse. Only Arisa and Satu could survive. Satu checked the figure's information. It turned out he was Zen who kidnapped Mia. They fought for a long time, but Zen turned out to be a very troublesome user of shadow magic. After that, Zen took Mia away. If Satu wanted to save Mia, then he had to go to the cradle. Satu jumped towards the portal that Zen created. Before it closed, he was thrown into a shadow prison. With his strength, he was able to free himself. Not long after, Satu arrived at where Zen was. Zen was surprised that Satu could enter his portal and free himself. Zen said only heroes could go to the cradle. Because of that, Satu was teleported out of the cradle. Satu was in front of a giant tree that was huge and tall. Satu entered the tree and met the plant spirit, Dryad. With Dryad's help, Satu was able to climb to the top floor. There, Satu had to fight several artificial humans created by the alchemist and Ian homunculus sisters. He also had to fight the iron golem, but Satu beat them all easily. After that, Satu entered the room where the Dryad was. But the Dryad there had dried up and wasn't moving anymore. Satu poured water and the Dryad came back to life. With her help, Satu could climb to even higher floors. There, Satu struggled against a group of insect monsters. After defeating them all, Satu got to where Zen and Mia were. Zen was surprised that Satu could get there so quickly. Then Zen called his followers. They all gang up against Satu. Meanwhile, Zen took Mia away from there. Satu fought homunculus sisters and a bunch of stone monsters. He managed to defeat them all. While chasing one of the girls, she begged Satu to fulfill her master's wishes. Satu then went to see Zen. After recognizing Sadu's greatness, Zen gave him a magic sword. Sadu asked what Zen's true intention was. It turned out that Zen just wanted to die. Long ago, his family was massacred by people from an enemy kingdom. Zen, who was the king of the undead, resurrected all the dead people to become undead. Then they massacred the enemy kingdom until nothing remained. Since then, Zen had been looking for a hero who could kill him because he wanted to get back with his dead wife. Therefore, Zen wished Satu to kill him. Satu used all his strength and then beat Zen until he died. Then Zen's wedding ring fell as the undead's body melts. Satu then took the ring. Then he met Mia, who was still unconscious. Unfortunately, Kadal began the process of self-destruction. Satu woke Mia up. It turned out that Mia knew the mechanism of the cradle. She couldn't stop the self-destruction but knew how to teleport. Seku took Mia to the previous room. He gathered the passed out homunculus sisters and asked Mia to take them all. Mia hurriedly teleported together with them. Meanwhile, Satu went downstairs where one of the homunculus sisters was still there. He took the girl and went to see the dryad. Luckily, dryad was able to teleport them out of the cradle. Unfortunately, the tsunami wave hit from behind. Satu rushed and ran as fast as lightning with fire magic. He turned the wave that almost hit him into steam. He continued to do so while running carrying the girl's body. After running fast, Sidhu managed to survive the disaster. He met Arisa and her other friends nearby. After that, the homunculus sisters gathered around. After their master died, they made Sidhu the new master. Sega gives then gave Zen's wedding ring to them. They planned to take the ring to Zen's wife's grave, while one of them would remain with Sidhu. To make it easier, Sidhu gave the girl the name Mana Nagasaki. Then they all returned to town and met their other friends, after that, Mia asked Satu to take her to the elf village. The next day, after everything was ready, Satu and his friends started their journey to the elf village. They traveled very far. When the horses were tired, they rested in the green hilly area and cooked lunch. It turned out that Mia couldn't eat meat, so Lisa made other dishes for her. The journey continued. When they rested for the second time, Mia showed off her musical skills by using leaves by blowing them. 
Satu and the others tried, but they never succeeded. After that, Arisa invited Satu to go around the rocks. There Arisa showed the ruins of rocks similar to a temple gate. That was when Satu remembered something from his past. He knew a mysterious girl who told him about reincarnation. He also remembered that there was a temple gate around his grandfather's house. Even so, his memory was not very clear, so Satu failed to see the face of the girl in his memory. The journey continued again. The children were practicing playing music using leaves while Satu found Zen's magic book in his inventory. He studied the book and learned magic spells. When studied carefully, the magic was similar to a logic programming language and its implementation was exactly the same. So Satu suspects that the inventor of magic is a programmer. The next day, after a long journey, Satu and his group arrived at the place where the rat people were. They were warmly welcomed by the rat people. After that, Mia approached the graves of the rat people who died protecting her. Mia also prayed for those who had died so that their spirits would rest in peace in nature. After that, Satu and the others went back on their journey. On the way, they saw a man named Dozen who beat a local young man. Liza said that Dozen was one of the corrupt soldiers who was in their city yesterday. After Dozen left, Setu treated the man using healing potions. The young man immediately recovered as soon as he drank it. Arisa said that Setu shouldn't just use potions because they were expensive and hard to get. That was why Setu planned to learn the science of making potions from Zen books. While they were resting, Setu did research over and over again to create the potion. After a long time of experimenting, he finally succeeded in making a potion. However, it turned out that Satu needed a particular bottle to store the potion, so that the quality did not decrease. So Satu planned to go to the nearest city, Kanu, to look for that particular bottle. The next day, they arrived in Kuhanu. He went to a potion shop there. When Satu arrived, there was a mysterious man who at first glance resembled Dozen. He just bought a lot of groceries. Satu went into the shop and said he wanted to buy elixir for potions, but it turned out that all the bottles had been bought up by previous buyers. The shop owner said Satu could go to the pottery shop to look for the same bottle. That night, Satu wandered around to explore the forest location on his black map. Each black area would immediately appear on the map as soon as Satu approached it. When he was wandering in the forest, he unknowingly penetrated a magical wall. When he checked the map, he had entered the illusion forest area. Not long after, a boy named In appeared and attacked Satu for entering the forest without permission. Not wanting to get hurt, Satu was forced to fight the boy. After that, a witch appeared and apologized because her student did as he pleased. Then they went to the witch's residence. It turned out that the witch was making a lot of potions. Ein helped the witch to make a potion. Every year they had to send 300 bottles of potions to Kahanu as part of the pact. By providing high-quality potions, the illusion forest would be protected. Saktu then returned to town. After that, Saktu relaxed at a bar. There he heard two mysterious people discussing a pact with a witch in the forest of illusions. If they could destroy the potion shipment, then the pact was also bricked. Sometime later, Ein came to town carrying a cart containing 300 potions. Unfortunately, he was chased by several people who wanted to attack him. Satu and the others came to help him. But unfortunately, these mysterious people managed to destroy more than 100 potions that Ein was carrying. Satu and the others went to meet the Kuhanu nobles. There he met Dozen and a nobleman named Birkins. When he heard Birkin's voice, Satu immediately knew that Birkin's was the person who was at the bar some time ago. It turned out that he and Dozen had conspired to break the pact with the Forest of Illusion. After arguing, Satu was given until the afternoon to make potions to bring the total to 300. Then Satu left the noble's residence and started collecting ingredients. However, when all the ingredients were complete, Satu reached a dead end. He didn't have any elixir to store the potions because Dozen had bought them all some time ago. Satu invited his friends to meet the man who owned the pottery factory. Because he had promised, he wanted to help even though it felt impossible. The factory owner also allowed Satu and his friends to make elixir. That afternoon, the process of making elixir for potions immediately began. At the same time, Ian was also desperately making potions. After a day of making, all the bottles had to be burned on the stove. Ian had also finished making the potion and was just waiting for the elixir. Finally, they had to wait for the burning to finish. As evening came, Seiku realized that trouble was coming. Dozen and several soldiers arrived. They did not allow the manufacturer of the elixir without permission. The factory owner said he was just teaching Satu and the others how to make pottery. Dozen didn't believe it and wanted to destroy the furnace. That was when Satu touched the furnace and did something. Dozen and the other soldiers destroyed the furnace and what was inside it. After messing around, they all immediately left. Satu asked Ayn to convey something to the witch in the forest of illusions. By using an owl, the message was sent. Meanwhile, Satu had moved 180 bottles of potion into his inventory. 
That way, they were ready to give a surprise back to Dozen and Birkins. When everything was ready, they left and handed over 300 potions to the authorities. Satu and the others faced Birkins and Dozen, who were shocked by the success. The officers had also checked the quality of the potions, and all of them were of good quality. Unfortunately, Birkins didn't want to stamp the potion that had been sent. It turned out Birkins was buying time until the end of the afternoon. Luckily, other nobles from Kuvanu arrived and stamped those potions. Birkins was surprised by the nobleman's arrival. It turned out that the letter sent to the Witch of the Forest of Illusion had arrived. The witch immediately contacted the Kuhanum nobles in authority. Not accepting being defeated, Birkins tried to attack the nobles, but magic like that didn't work against the Kuhanum nobles. Birkins was almost killed, but said who stopped the Kuhanum nobles' intentions because there were children there. The conspiracy conflict in the city was successfully resolved by both the Forest of Illusion witches and the Kuvanum nobles. Everyone was grateful for the struggle of Satu and his friends. The next day, Satu and the others continued their journey to take Mia back to Elf Village. This is the end of Death March Season 1. Thank you so much for staying on this channel and watching our videos. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel so we can keep you updated with our latest content. See you in the next video.